All right, welcome back, Pivotal Discourse fans. I am sitting down with Dr. Andrew Krakowski, the chair of the dermatology department. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Wonderful. I didn't screw that up. <laughs> so everybody has heard the word dermatology, and I think most people know that it has to relate to skin. But what exactly is dermatology? Well, it literally is the study of skin, but it's much more than just skin which I'll put a plug in for, is your largest organ of the human body. If mm -hmm. you think about that, it's kind of mind-blowing. But okay. um, sorry, cardiology, sorry, neurology. The most important organ is clearly your skin. Boom. It keeps you alive, keeps you protected from all of nature, which is constantly trying to kill us every day. Sunlight, UV radiation, bug bites, poison ivy, everything's out there trying to get in there and uh, wreak havoc on us, and our skin keeps us safe. But dermatology... At its core is the study of the skin and, and the medicine around that, but it also includes hair, nails, and mucosa, so your lips. Interesting. And uh, yeah, so we're all sort of expert at when you, when you graduate through a, a boarded program, you are supposed to be expert in all four of those aspects of dermatology. And then it's kind of an interesting little sub expectation that in addition to being able to take care of those four things clinically, we are also supposed to be trained completely in cutaneous surgery. So the surgery of those, the skin, the hair, the nails and mucosa. And then quite uniquely to dermatology, we are also trained in the histopathological examination of those four things. So we have to be able to sit down in a microscope and look at our own slides, uh, sometimes our own, sometimes our colleagues, and give a diagnosis of what we're seeing through the microscope in addition to what we see with, with our eyes, the so-called eye-opsy. But uh, that's unique. I don't know of another specialty where the, where the surgeon reads his or her own pathology and then comes back to the patient with a clinical diagnosis and course of management. Oh, that's interesting. It's interesting and very difficult. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. I was going to say you might know a, a few things here. I know a little bit about a little, that, and that's where I'm. That's my comfort zone. Well, and then on top of it, you are also a pediatric dermatologist. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And the only pediatric dermatologist in Lehigh Valley. Is that also correct? That is also correct. As of today, you know things change, but there's there's not that many of us out there. I think the last time I looked online, the Society for Pediatric Dermatology. Pedsderm.net is the uh, is the organizational link there, but uh, I think there are only about 250 of us in the country. Hmm. Last time I looked, so it's been hard to recruit pediatric dermatologists into pediatric dermatology because of well, COVID didn't help. The rotations have been cut down, so going to children's hospitals has been significantly impacted. But um, it's it's a it's not for everyone. Let's just say that it's the only thing I could ever imagine doing, and I think it was. I just saw a great movie uh, called Val. It was Val Kilmer. Oh, yeah. You, see, you know what oh, I'm talking yeah. about? It was yeah, really yeah. powerful. And I think, uh, I think I'm going to try to quote Mark Twain from that movie, which is like a quote of a quote. But uh, basically, find someone who will pay you to do what you would love doing anyway, right? And that's kind of... Amen to that. That's Pete's derm to me. So mm -hmm. uh, I love it. it. But, you know, it does take a special kind of person to be able to hear uh, a child, speak with a child, and then have the same conversation but at a different level with the parents uh, all the while the kid might not want to be there and you know we know how that sounds uh, both in that in the exam room but also out in the waiting room so it's it's uh, it's a sort of a selective process to get to pediatric dermatology but it's one that I just always imagined that I would do and it came true so I'm so when you, when you went to med school that was something that you wanted to do right out of the gate well that's interesting no so uh, strangely enough I was actually an American history major before I even got into medicine, and in fact, we had this wonderful opportunity to go to the uh, U.S. Open, U.S. Senior Open this week at Saucon Valley Country Club. I was on a career path to actually do landscape architecture to design golf courses, crazily enough. No kidding. Yeah, that's. Uh, I worked at a couple golf courses through my, my summer vacations and um, really fell in love with just the, the landscape, not so much the golf. I'm a horrible golfer. And, um, you and me both. <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually want to be that good at it. I, I think you get you know too serious. If I'm, if I'm doing something for five hours, I better not be mad at myself sure, the whole time. Sure, sure. So, <laughs> That's why I stopped better. caring a long time ago. I was yeah. getting way too upset. I was like, this is A, yeah. it's too expensive, and B, I'm, it's too much time, so I'm just going to have a good time. Absolutely. So uh, that was the career path until, strangely enough, I got onto a golf course 
in New Jersey, if you've ever driven 78 to go to the, I guess, to go to New York City or, or the Jersey Shore, you've driven by the place. It's called Fiddler's Elbow Country Club. Oh, yeah. Huge. 800 acre course, three 18 hole golf courses. And um, I was a cart boy there. So I was doing, you know, cleaning the carts after the hours and just scrubbing down with a bunch of people that wanted to be actually golfers. I, sure. I was the only one there who was just kind of looking for a summer job at the time. And I, got this wonderful opportunity from the general manager, um, Mr. McGee, who was a very progressive general manager as it related to stewardship of the environment. And he asked me, he said, hey, listen, I got a project from the Audubon Society. We have an opportunity to turn this golf course into an 800 acre bird wildlife sanctuary, which was pretty ironic since probably the golf courses in, in the area were what resulted in the death of a lot of birds in the 50s from DDT. Right. And, you know, we're lucky enough, I don't know if you know, right behind here is a, is a bald eagle's roost uh, right here in Allertown. I didn't know you you're can, such a bird guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. So well, I am because of this project. Okay. And uh, I fell in love with it. And um, sure enough, at the end of those, at the six-month project, which I did as an internship for my landscape architecture program, this wonderful organization, nonprofit called the Raptor Trust came out and, and in a sort of an exclamation point on the project said, hey, you know, we understand the history of golf courses and how they related to what happened with the uh, animals, but we'd like you to release a couple of birds of prey onto the property and hopefully they'll they'll take, they'll take up uh, a living there. And I got to hold this thing called a, a, a sparrow hawk, an American kestrel. It's a tiny little bird of prey, maybe this big. And it looks like it should weigh maybe this full coffee mug, but in reality, it weighs about the paperweight of that single piece of paper. I mean, it's it's tremendously awe-inspiring to hold this bird and feel its little heart going da, 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 and knowing that it's like feathers, you know? And uh, it it changed my life. It was one of these moments where I said, hey, I don't know what I, I don't think I can work in, a, in an office. I need to work with my hands, taking care of, you know, living things. And there it was a kind of a, an interesting journey back because I hadn't done any any of my medical school classes or requirements, biology, chemistry, physics, organic chemistry, all that stuff had to get done. So I did a year called the post back year, which is extra money and, and a lot of work, but I got done that. And then it was like, okay, now how do I get into medical school? And just an interesting little plug for, for Bethlehem here. Uh, we have a really wonderful, I guess, son of Bethlehem in a gentleman named Edward Benz. He was a schoolmate of my mom and dad's at Central Catholic. And uh, my dad was a physician, internal medicine, geriatrician. I knew I wanted to go into pediatrics probably as a result of, of what I saw and, and how he interacted with his patients. But I didn't know how to get into medicine. And, and Dr. Benz at the time was the chair of medicine at Johns Hopkins Medical Institute. And he went on to lead the Dana-Farber uh, Institute up at Boston for basically the, the world's leading cancer research facility. And he said, listen, if you want to, if you're serious about this medicine thing, come down to Hopkins. I didn't even know what Hopkins was, I, you know, at the time and how lucky I was. But he said, come down and spend a day and meet some people and, and talk about your career. Now, uh, I did that and I, I didn't get in that Johns Hopkins. So there was no nepotism, but uh, <laughs> but I it put me on the path and um, I did everything I needed to do, worked for a couple of years and got into medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. So it was I was on from day one a path to be a pediatrician. OK. So that was the long-winded answer to how I got into pediatrics, but uh, it was, you know, birds, kids. It's cl clearly a, a straight line, right? No, no, no probably not. I was going to say, where, where's, the, <laughs> where's the connection there? I might be well, missing it. but It's more that I, I'm, always, uh, I, I'm always the goofy guy in the room, and I think I'm the kid at heart. So okay. uh, most of my young patients kind of get my sense of humor, and maybe some of my adult colleagues do or don't at different times. But um, I was always more comfortable around working with kids than, than not. So I went through medical school, becoming a pediatrician, I actually did a full residency in pediatrics at Johns Hopkins Medical Institute and um, spent three years down there. And while I was doing my rotations as a pediatrician is when I discovered that there is such a thing called pediatric dermatology, where you walk into a room and use your eyes, which I was interested in doing because I'm pretty good visually. But more importantly, there was no invasive maneuvers, not usually necessary to make most of the diagnoses that we make as a pediatric dermatologist. And in fact, what I found very interesting about that career, that specialty was that unlike some of 
adult dermatology where the adult dermatologists, we know their, their main job or one of their main jobs is, hey, identify a skin cancer early on, make sure it's not a skin cancer. If it is, get it off and protect that patient so that he or she can have a wonderfully healthy rest of their lives. So in, in the adult world, you're doing a lot of procedures, biopsies, and you're, and you're doing some that turn out to be not skin cancers. So, but you have to get some wrong in order to catch the ones that you might otherwise miss. Sure. That's adult derm. Pediatric dermatology, I was always drawn to the fact that it's sort of the opposite of that. It's, it's protecting the kids and trying to really make a diagnosis and, and know what you're looking at so that you don't have to perform an unnecessary procedure on a kid. And um, that just drew me even more into the specialty. So I fell in love with it. Of course, going through medical school to become a pediatrician was a much different career track than becoming a dermatologist. And um, I went to apply for dermatology and didn't have the didn't have the CV, the curriculum vitae, as they say, to get in. So I had to work two years as a research fellow out in San Diego. Oh, tough, was, tough, tough, tough. It rough, was tough. Yeah, rough, it was, yeah, it was hard. Uh, you know, I I, I kind of pushed through. Learned how to sail and learned how uh, to put on sunscreen. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Totally. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't a bad gig, and um, and then sort of wormed my way into the University of California San Diego's residency program for dermatology. That was three year gig, and then came out and did an extra year in dedicated to pediatric dermatology at rate, what's called Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego, with a great group of people. Probably at the time, it was the number one pediatric dermatology program in the country, and uh, we saw. You know everything from the basic stuff to the most most um, egregious and uh, most intensive so it was a great training ground and um, that's what I bring to Lehigh Valley I guess now you're originally from the Lehigh Valley you said your parents went to Central I'm not my mom and dad went to Central Catholic my all four of my grandparents my two my mom's parents lived in um, actually very close to our office in Lanark Road, which I think is funny. I used to get in trouble for playing in the cornfields. Some farmer would come out and yell at me and my sister for playing, and now it's a dermatology office. So oh, we made hilarious. that guy rich, I, I'm assuming. That's hysterical. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty crazy. Uh, so they live there on Aberdeen Street, and uh, actually very close to Frank Ford, the, our president at Sacred Heart. They, okay. He was f- friendly with my grandparents. And then on the other side of town, Whitehall, my dad's parents lived. So I would come up once a month, but we grew up in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Okay. And okay. then uh, spent half my life in, in Valley Forge and the other half was in various places in New Jersey. My father was one of the one of the first, actually the first class to do an MD MBA down at Wharton. So he was drawn to the pharmaceutical side of, of clinical medicine. And we sort of followed his career path from Merck to Johnson & Johnson up to a company called Bard. So we just, we kind of moved up through through the New Jersey ranks up, up to that. But um, yeah, that's uh, local enough, I guess. Okay. Uh, I just find it interesting. We're both Pennsylvania guys. We both spent some time out in California. You did San Diego. I did L.A. Oh, Come nice. back. You're a pediatric doctor. I'm a fake internet doctor. So <laughs> kind of worked hey, out so, for everybody, right? Sometimes I feel like a fake, but you know, fake no. it till you make it, right? Exactly. Yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> so let's get back to a little bit of uh, the pediatric dermatology, because mm-hmm. I find that absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, especially since um, I, I have two children at home and my little guy, he had such skin issues when he was a baby, like baby acne, like, mm-hmm. and it's, it's scary because you don't really know what's going on. And he mm-hmm. still has exceptionally sensitive skin to this day. Like if my guy gets a bug bite on his face, mm-hmm. it looks like, he looks like Rocky, like his <laughs> eye swells up. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, they're going to call child services on us. They think <laughs> we're going to beat this kid. But uh, it's just very interesting. Between my two kids, his skin is just super duper sensitive. Mm-hmm. So, talk to me a little bit more about pediatric dermatology and and what you know parents are are going through these days. Well, I mean, you just hit you hit the the nail on the head in terms of one of the more common diagnoses that we're seeing right now. It's a start. It's officially summer, so we're outside a lot. Uh, my own two kids, seven and nine year old boys, um, they just joined the. The swim team in nice. Bethlehem area, so they're outside uh, painfully from like five o'clock in in the evening till like nine o'clock at night doing the swim meets, and you know nothing good's out there in, in the dark. You know, Mm-mm. <laughs> we, there's there with with just a swimsuit on. These kids are coming home ravaged by bugs, mosquito bites, uh, whatever else is creepy crawly in you know in the grass that they're rolling around in. And I, I agree with you. My, my seven-year-old looks like he got shot by a paintball gun. You know, just 
and uh, wakes up in the middle of the night scratching and itching and can't sleep well. So it's right. So one of the hardest diagnoses I would say that we have to make in a kid is bug bites. And Interesting. You, which doesn't make sense, right? Like you would say, why? It's pretty easy. Well, clinically, it's not hard. Right? Clinically, you walk in to the room and you, and you look at the child and you see, okay, little Johnny or little Mary's got uh, a couple dots, red red welts, one, two, three. We call that breakfast, lunch, dinner. You know, some, some bug is latched on there. Maybe a flea doesn't normally eat human blood. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, the mouse, or I'm sorry, the dog flea, the cat flea, they're named that because that's their host. Their natural host is dog or cat. Interesting. They don't know what they're jumping on. So they jump on, they'll take a couple bites and uh, a blood meal, they say, you know, a little, little suck. And uh, they realize, hey, that's human. Ugh, I, I want to get off there. So they, they jump off eventually. So you, you get these kind of like little stereotypical presentations of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's only over the areas where usually it's exposed, right? So there's a sharp cutoff at the at the arms, like when you roll your sleeves up, you wouldn't expect to get bug bites much up here. They'd be more concentrated and open, uh, neck, wherever, ankles, you know, shorts, c cut off at the knees. So it's you get a pretty good idea that this is what we call an outside job. Something from the outside of the body is doing it, doing it to the skin. The, the trick is to try to convince mom or dad that that's what it is, right? Because they say, well, no, no, this has been going on. These welts have been there for six weeks. And Johnny is the only one who gets them. How come nobody else is getting bit by by bugs? Well, that's part of the part of the process of making this diagnosis is to convince them that probably everybody is getting bit by bugs, right? Like when you go out and get bit by a mosquito bite, you don't welt up like your son does, right? right? I I might get a little itchy, but I don't welt up like my son does. That's because kids have this sort of hypersensitivity reaction to the bug bites. Their immune system is, is immature. It's young. It's trying to figure out the world around it, what's trying to kill it from the outside in. And so it has this like exaggerated, robust response to these bug bites. So we've gotten around it both to, I think, more accurately make a diagnosis that reflects the true nature of these bites, but also decide to try to convince the parents that it's not just bug bites, it's something different. So we have this thing called papular, which means bumpy, urticaria, which is hives, right? So it's exactly that, right? It's, it's a wheeled up, swollen welt that's sort of round, you know, in shape. So that's the papular urticaria. And that truly, that diagnosis truly reflects the fact that this is a much deeper, longer process than just a simple bug bite on, on an adult or even an older kid. <laughs> and sometimes you got to biopsy a child just to, to prove that to the families because they think it's something more worrisome. And it can be in, in times. I mean, they, you know, there there are some nasty things that can look like bug bites, but thankfully, common things being common, it's usually a bug bite. And um, then you have to then get past the parents' concern and anxiety, sort of sometimes unspoken, like, oh, I'm not keeping a clean home. No, I mean, you know, sure, there's bed bugs. You, you do have to worry about bed bugs. They're, they're out there, hotels. There's a, there's a website that tracks where the bed bugs are in the different hotels, which are totally creepy. But, you know, most of the time you're talking about fleas or mosquito bites or gnats or these things called noceums. I don't know if you've had to deal with them uh, biting midges. They, you know, they, that's what they do. And uh, it's not, it has nothing to do with if you're keeping a clean home. And a lot of people do take that very personally and like, oh, I'm failing my child. Right. I mean, no, it's this is a natural thing. And Common happens yeah. to everybody. And then it's like, well, how how are they how are they around for six weeks? Well, they're they're around for a lot longer than that sometimes. They, it really it's like there's so much immune system activity in those bites that those welts can easily persist for six to eight. 12 weeks and it's trying to convince the parents eventually they're going to go down and you're going to see that it's going to get better but it's going to be a problem through the summer and it won't be a problem in the winter hey guys mr wellness here from the wellness 101 show join me as we take a quick step-by-step -step journey of basic tips and tricks on how to stay healthy from developing easy healthy habits to surviving allergy season and everything in between the Wellness 101 Show is fun, educational, and designed to help you thrive. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel by scanning the QR code and hit the bell icon to be notified of any future episodes. It's time to make healthcare fun with Wellness 101. Interesting. So, <laughs> so I always tell my son, because he always, I mean, complaining because he's swollen. He's like, why does this always happen to me? And I said, it's because you're so sweet, sweetheart. You know, like, <laughs> sweet. daddy doesn't get them because I'm bitter inside. Bitter, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> that, 
There anyway. might be some truth to that. <laughs> so let's let's stay with uh, summer mm-hmm. right now. Um, I, I was excited when I found out you were coming on the show because I think skincare in general has mm-hmm. become a much greater topic of conversation even back when you and I were kids. Mm-hmm. Like back in the 80s, we went outside. Yeah. We didn't put on sunblock. We just went out. We were out all day long. We didn't come in until the sun came down yep now it, i feel like and especially as a parent like i'm lathering my kids up <laughs> with all sorts of stuff sure and what i want to know is i mean yes we're, we're trying to put on sunblock and protect our kids and, our, and ourselves at this point mm-hmm. we know that skin cancer is a, a big problem but is putting chemicals on your body is that also a problem you know it's a very it's a very tough question there's there's certainly there's certainly a literature out there that tells us putting certain chemicals on the skin can cause problems. I mean, we know that there are materials like asbestos. Um, there's some chemicals that will absolutely, if if absorbed enough, will cause birth defects through. It can be through the skin. Wow. Um, so yes, I mean, obviously, but that's how topical medicines work as, as well, right? You put you put a steroid on to calm those bug bites. And we know eventually, it'll, if it's formulated correctly, it will absorb through the skin and get into the, the tissue where you want it, hopefully. But some of these medicines, especially if they're formulated at a higher potency, if they're applied at a greater frequency than they should be, if they're used for a longer duration, you can get systemic levels of, mm. of certain medicines for sure. Mm-hmm. So the concept that a, a sunscreen could be absorbed through the skin is not crazy. Okay. Um, in fact, some of the sunscreens are designed to be absorbed into the skin. So these are your chemical sunscreens that are designed to be p- applied to the surface of the skin, but then they get absorbed into the through sort of the epidermis, the top layer of the skin, and they and they exist there to sort of catch the ultraviolet rays as they are penetrating the skin. Right, they're absorbing that radiation and preventing it from going further and causing more damage. So absolutely, there's a whole class of sunscreens that are designed to do that very specific thing. Uh, there's another class of sunscreens in general, and there's a lot of interplay between the two, but uh, physical blockers. So a physical blocker would be like a zinc or a titanium oxide that's placed on the skin that's sort of more, I guess, more for the layperson, reflects the, the sun's rays more than it absorbs them, right? So that's why they're, they're very white. White's a reflective color as you can see in the studio. So um, <laughs> so those are designed more to sit up on the skin surface and act to, I guess, more accurate, to use your term, block, or rather right. than absorb and or protect, repel. Rep- repel, right. And um, those are specifically designed not to sort of, sort of be absorbed as much. Now you can get into discussions around nano particles and, and the smaller the size, the less opaque looking they're on the skin, these blockers, so that they're more cosmetically elegant. So smaller size particles doing the same thing functionally, but now they're they're smaller, so could they be absorbed? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's there's a there are huge controversies around that and what that means, and I'm in no way an expert on that very specific um, controversy but looking at you know hawaii I, we were we were lucky enough to go out for a conference a couple of years ago and you were not allowed to use certain sunscreens in hawaii because of what it was doing to the coral reefs there oh interesting so yeah it's uh, i mean there's there's definitely there can be effects with anything right i mean i could i could hurt myself with this cup of water if i wanted to in probably a number of different ways um so you have to be careful but ultimately for me, and, and much like you, I apply sunscreen to my kids. Sure. Uh, it's funny, you said in the 80s you were running around without any sunblock. Uh, in the 80s, I was growing up in, in the house with my dad, who I told you worked for J&J, and he was bringing home sunscreen before it was widely widely used. Yeah. And I think, you know, somewhat experimenting on No, I'm kidding. But uh, <laughs> we were putting it on in the 80s. When I know my my friends didn't know like why why do you look like Casper the friendly ghost uh, right. Drew and I was like well because my dad wants to protect my skin so that's how I grew up and um, and our children now my wife and I my wife's a, a veterinarian um, physician uh, for animals so you know she she's a, a scientist just as much if not more than I am and we made the conscious decision that listen risk benefit right uh, first we'll let's look at what what harms out there 
a lifetime of sun exposure, doing stuff like the swim team, we know you've got a chance to develop basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. Those are the two most common cancers, not just the two most common skin cancers. The most common cancers in humans are skin cancers, right? You, you've got a, a decent chance of developing them if you're getting sunburns, if you're getting, if you're living an outdoor life, recreational lifestyle, or you're not protecting yourself. And then there's the more, even more deadly form of skin cancer called melanoma, mm. where we know there's a lot of environmental, but there's also a lot of genetic uh, interplay there in terms of who gets what. But looking at that and looking at not just the cancer risk, but how about photo aging? Do we, do we want to look like you're 20 or 30 years older than you are when you're 50 years old? Um, that's a, that's a decision that we made for our kids that, Hey, risk benefit. We believe that sun protection makes sense. Now let's be smart about it. Right? So we only apply the physical blockers, the, the zinc oxide, the titanium dioxide products to our kids. And, um, I mean, you know, I can give you a, a bevy of different brands that I, I suggest every day in the clinic. I'm, I have no conflict of interest, but uh, please do. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. One one I love is a Vino Baby Sensitive. Uh, you will, if you come to the shore and you see us out uh, on the beach, you will know the Krakowski family because you will see a bunch of very white looking human beings. That's the problem, right? It's it's not cosmetically elegant. Who cares? Yeah, You're who being cares? protected. If I can see it on my kids, I know it's on, and um, and it's working. As soon as you apply it, it doesn't take time to absorb into the skin. So as soon as you apply it, it starts to work. If you go in with that particular brand that I really do use myself, um, it's water resistant for 80 minutes. No such thing as waterproof. It's water resistant. Right. It used to say waterproof, but there's nothing that's waterproof. So water resistant. And that's actually a, a very a very lab oriented uh, designation. So you, you have to put this on, for example, your forearm and then put it in a whirlpool and they do tests to see how long that uh, that's durable on the skin. So they have 40 minutes or 80 minutes as a water resistant uh, designation. This product is an 80 minute protective. And, uh, you know, you go in the Jersey Shore where the waves are pounding you up. You come out, you've been, you can see physically that the, the sunscreen is no longer on you. You got to reapply. If you go up and, and, and towel off and you wipe that sunscreen off, you should just assume that you've wiped it enough that it's, it's totally useless. Put some more on. So, um, yeah, you will, you will see a bunch of white looking people uh, constantly reapplying, you know, easily every two hours if they're not going in the water. But our rule is when you come out of the water and towel off, you put it on again. Or if you're sweating a lot. Now, one thing I do love about that particular brand is that it's quote unquote tear free, which turns out doesn't mean it won't irritate your eyes. Right. It means it won't physically cause you to tear. But this one, if you've ever had sunscreen on your face and sweat, it's the worst. It's the worst. It's nagging. Get this like, what's this thing? It'll wipe in your ear, your eye the whole day. Like, I mean, sweat in your eye is bad enough. Now put some sunblock yeah. in there and forget it. Yeah. It's just, it's distracting. Uh, this one's not so bad, you know, and um, I, I like it really a lot for that, that particular reason alone. So that's uh that's what we carry actually at uh, St. Luke's Anderson Pharmacy. Interesting. The, the pharmacy worked with us to carry the product, so we actually do ask our patients you might to, want to, to listen search to for the it. professionals on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like go find that one in the pharmacy and buy it because it's one we would use ourselves. Interesting. Um, thoughts on uh, bug spray? Mm. So, like, perfect example. Last night we were throwing the ball around in the mm -hmm. backyard. If my little guy is out there. Once the sun goes down or starts to go down, he is going to get mealed upon. <laughs> so, you know, we have to put off on him to try to mitigate those bug bites. Sure. Now, do you think there's a risk versus reward with um, mm -hmm. bug repellent? Yeah. So there's they're about. So this is one where I can speak very, I think, specifically to the topic and um, and also offer the listeners some some hopefully great advice. If you go to epa.gov, that's the Environmental Protection Agency's website, there's two things that I use that website for. One is the UV index. I don't know if you know what the UV index is, but- uh, I've heard it a thousand You've times. heard it a thousand, but if you, if you are concerned about skin cancer, if you're concerned about photo aging or early or premature photo aging, then you gotta know about the UV index. And the UV index is this sort of multifactorial assessment of your day-to-day -day risk for going out and getting damaged by ultraviolet light radiation. It takes into account your local position, like literally by zip code, 
and it's free, by the way. You just enter the zip code on the website. It tells you what the day-to-day -day UV index is. It takes into account your, your geography, your altitude. So as we get higher up, higher altitudes, oh, yeah. you're actually at greater risk. So airline pilots, you know, historically have been have a higher risk of skin cancer because presumably they're flying at altitude. The closer you are to the equator makes a difference. More sun, more direct sun. Um, but then you've also got ozone to consider. If, if it's depleted here, but not somewhere else, you're going to have a higher risk and a higher UV index. So oh, that's interesting. yeah, the, the index goes up to 11 plus. I don't know. It's like spinal tap. I don't know why it goes to 11, but this one does. <laughs> And, 12 uh, is just too much. 12 is too much. Right. 11 plus. We're right. going to draw the line if there. If we stayed 11 plus, we're okay. Why they didn't pick 10, I don't know. But, uh, you know, that's what it is. But uh, as it goes up, your risk goes up. So you can you can get this. And, and I actually am trying to get the, the local news stations to at least put this thing in the bottom corner of the screen for the yeah. weather every day to definitely. tell you. You know, it's, it's a no-brainer to use. So the epa.gov has that resource. You should definitely use it. And, uh, and so the other thing I use that website for is to pick a more specific insect repellent or bug repellent, tick repellent for my patients. So there's there's mosquito and then there's tick classically repellents, right? And some do both, so you gotta look. But um, there's about four chemicals that serve as the sort of backbone of these products. And and what's interesting is the CDC, the Center for Di Centers for Disease Control, also another great resource which has become well known because of COVID. I was going to say, I think it's become a household name. It's a household point. name. So they, they kind of partner with the EPA. It's maybe one of those few times the government works together and, and synergistically comes out with something helpful. And uh, they, they have done two kind of things. One is they have looked at which products are effective and safe. Okay. So you have to have, I mean, you have to look for that designation, but they have done those studies, um, including on pregnant women. Interesting. Okay? So that's a pretty vulnerable population. So if you find one that has been deemed safe and effective, you have a little bit, well, a lot more reassurance that that, is, that, that legwork has been done and those studies have been submitted and evaluated. And now you've got a product that hopefully you can trust. Then there's that that sort of split. Do you want? Are you looking for tick repellent? Or are you looking for mosquito repellent? And um, some do both. Which chemical backbone do you want? By far, the world's most common is DEET. D E E T. Right. And there's a it, the word itself is about this long, and I could give it a shot, but I don't think I'm going to. Um, but this is the most studied insect repellent in the history of humans, and uh, we've got. It's interesting, for not only for the number of years that it's been used, but on the number of people that it's been used on, we're talking millions of millions of life years, right? So, or, or, or people and, and hundreds, I should say, of life years, thousands of life years, looking at this and saying, okay, what what's the problem with it? And, and there are some problems, right? First off, it's flammable. Yeah. Okay, so how many times do you have a barbecue outside and you're spraying down with whatever whatever product you get? You got to be careful. It literally is flammable. And you can go on YouTube and find pictures of kids testing it in, against an open flame. I've seen it. It's a, it's kind of it's kind of nutty, but it it does catch fire. Secondly, it can break down um, synthetics. So if you've got like some plastics and you're putting this on on a regular basis, it can actually break them down. Interesting. So just from a functional perspective, be aware of that. Um, I would say the big concern about DEET is its neurotoxicity. It, can it cause central nervous system issues? And overall, overwhelmingly, the number of reported problems that, that have been associated with DEET being used on that many people for this many years is like insignificant. <laughs> Okay. okay. I, I mean, it's not insignificant for the people who had the problem. And, and, but that problem may or may not have been related to the chemical. But just overall, it's been deemed safe enough that the World Health Organization says, we need this. Because consider the risk benefit again, right? Skin cancer, sunscreen. I'm going to take the sunscreen every time. Insect repellent, slight, slight, insignificant, statistically insignificant risk of neurotoxicity. What am I up against? The thing, the insect that kills. Or I, I blew it, I blew the punchline. The animal that kills the most humans globally on an annual basis. Humans. 
No. Mosquitoes. No kidding. Not even close. Malaria. Huge. Right? Oh, Major yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're talking about maybe not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but you're talking about going going outside of, of the United States and you've got Zika virus, you've got malaria, you've got dengue fever, you've got, you know, fill in the blanks. It's not a it's not a it's not a hard thing for me to decide. That's what I'm putting on my yeah. kids, you know. So when you're out in the backyard, what do you have to think about? Well, you're right. You know, you can still get some conditions from bug bites, right? You can get Lyme disease. You can get Rocky Mountain spotted fever from ticks. And and by the way, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it sounds like it would be a West Coast problem. It's actually now more prevalent on the East Coast than it is on the West Coast, if you can believe that. And that's a fatal condition, hmm. right? So you get bit by a, a tick carrying Rocky Mountain fo- spotted fever. If you get in, an infection, uh, statistically, you've got about four to five days to treat that and and decrease the mortality rate or else it's it's very dangerous like i believe about 25 to 50 percent mortality rate with that last time i looked no kidding yeah pretty serious uh lyme disease has its own bevy of of uh, problems that that comes with that but uh so so again for us in in the right setting if we know we're going to be outside with our kids we're using insect repellent what do we do to mitigate the risk well it turns out that there are different concentrations of DEET and products, and, and again, the four backbone chemicals that you could find, they're all different potencies, right? Interestingly, a higher potency does not necessarily confer greater protection. It's just longer lasting protection, okay? So if you went to a product like Deep Woods Off, and I believe I've, I've seen that as high as 50, 50% DEET, or a lot of DEET, that's going to last longer, like maybe four hours, okay, versus 10 or 15% DEET, which might last an hour, hour and a half. It's not a straight line either. It's, it's a curve. So what we do is we apply the weakest potency that we know we need for the time we think we're going to be outdoors. And, if we're, and instead of putting on more than we need, we'll just reapply the weaker product a second time. Okay. Right? And it's also where you apply, right? So you never... Or you shouldn't. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get up on my soapbox. But you never let a kid spray DEET on his or her own face, right? Like that's going to get in your mouth. It's going to get in your eyes. That's going to get more absorbed. What do you do? You, you apply it first to your hands and then slap it on, you know? Okay. Uh, put it on the areas where you are um, exposed only. You don't need it. You don't need to bathe in it, right? You can actually impregnate your clothing that's the process of putting a chemical in, into a material with uh, pyrethroids, which you can get at you know REI or L.L. Bean. They sell they sell these chemicals where you can soak your clothing, or it's a similar from like mosquito nets that you would put up sure. if you were camping. They they have a, a it's, it's actually derived from the chrysanthemum flower. It's kind of cool if you ever if you ever go out in your garden or someone's garden, you, they're growing chrysanthemums. Take a look. Not a lot of bugs crawling on chrysanthemums. They they don't want to be on them because of these pyrethrins. And um, so you can you can actually get sort of bug repellent clothing, hmm. and uh, so you don't need to apply the DEET directly to your skin as much in, well, in those situations. That was going to be my next question. Do you yeah. like spray off on your clothing? Like I know, like sometimes if I wear a hat, I'll spray it on the hat instead of putting it on my face, and that usually kind of keeps yeah, them off. Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there's again the the synthetic materials probably are taking a little bit of a beating, but that makes sense to me. I actually don't. I specifically don't apply to skin that's then being pulled over. That's going to occlude potentially the the area and and again increase that absorption in. So yeah, I I apply it um, where I need it and as much as on my clothing as I can, so that I'm not putting it right on my skin. That's I think okay. I mean, I, I think I would recommend doing that. The other thing is for ticks, one of the most effective things you can do is tie, it looks dorky, but you tie your pants off or you tuck your pants, your pant leg into your sock and then tie that off so that the tick, once it gets on you, it's going to it's gonna migrate up your leg, but you got a chance to get it off before it goes under your clothing and gets onto your skin. Look like a dork, get Lyme disease. Yeah, and- yeah. Well, go, yeah, ro- Rocky, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is not a good look. Yeah. It doesn't go... Spots don't go with checkered shirts and stuff. Yeah, totally. Yeah. totally. It's so it's so nineties. <laughs> so, <laughs> so quick sidebar. Getting back to, so, well, first I want to ask. So just like the sunscreen, do you have a specific recommendation for, um, 
insect repellent. And again, we're not mm-hmm. sponsored by any of no. these products yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I do, I do like off. I think it's a good brand. It's been around. They have a, a long list of different products that are available. Um, there is uh what's the other one? I think badger we've used before. But again, just if I heard you correctly, mm-hmm. get the lower concentration, just apply it more. The lowest concentration for the time that you're going to be outdoors and need it. And if you if you need it more, you reapply. Also be aware, just as a, as a plug, since we were talking about sunscreens, sunscreens, there are products, combo products, where they combine insect repellent with the sunscreen. Oh, interesting. Not interesting. Oh. Not a good idea. Not good, people. Not good. I mean, it is interesting in the sense that someone came up with that, and it makes sense. But what we know is, actually, you tend to have to apply your sunscreen more frequently than you do for an insect repellent. That makes sense. So now you're putting extra insect repellent on yourself for no reason. Not good. Secondly, it can actually, the insect repellent can actually interfere with the ability of the sunscreen to work as well as it should. So it, it, it's been shown to do that, decreasing the sun protection factor of the sunscreens. So it, you want to do, you want to keep that separate as much as it is. I mean, I know it's like hurting you know, cats uh, trying to get our kids to put sunscreen on. And then if you're adding the, the insect repellent, it's an extra thing you got to do. Oh, but it's it, so frustrating. Yeah. And the kids don't want to wear it. Well, and it's just, oh, do I have to put on something? Yes. You need you a do. blow dart. <laughs> and then you just, <laughs> they trank them, right? And then that's, that's where that's my a, wife comes in. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah. She's got all the oh, gear. Oh, she's got the horse tranquilizer. She's got the horse tranquilizer. <laughs> yep. <we> just, <laughs> and then they sleep for a couple seconds. I can lube them up with whatever <laughs> I need and then get them on their way. But it's hard. But that's that's a corner you shouldn't cut. You, you keep those products separate, and, and and you'll be in you'll be at less risk for trouble. Okay, um, staying with sunscreen, I have to tell you, um, as a bald man, it is something that I have to think about all the time. Mm-hmm. You burn the top of your head just once, and you will never ever forget to apply sunscreen. Okay. So last year, um, I'm getting there. I'm a bit. <laughs> Stick with it. Fight the fight. <laughs> yeah. uh, when you mentioned hair, I was just like, oh, do you have any tips of how to grow hair back? But we'll get into that. <laughs> we can get into that. Um, so last year, I took a, I'm a big hiker, and mm-hmm. I took a trip to Glacier National Park. Problem with Glacier is it is the highest concentration of grizzly bears in the <laughs> lower 48 states. Okay. So they have all these rules and regulations of what you should be taking with you. You got to put your food and all your uh, cosmetics elsewhere mm-hmm. and you're not supposed to wear sunscreen so i'm like okay how? because it's attractive to bears 100 percent. any type of scent was, was was it beef jerky flavored sunscreen what? i'm telling you I, <laughs> bears are they don't care they smell something yeah. they're going for it yeah and i don't feel like getting mealed on no. so i'm like okay how am i going to do this so i yeah. started looking at different products and they actually have um is it upf uh, UPF rated clothing? Yes. Yes. So I got this cool hiking shirt that mm-hmm. came down and ha- actually had like thumb loops. So like my hands were practically covered mm-hmm. and I always wear gloves anyway. And then it had a hood and it worked out really, yeah. really well. I was supl- I was surprised. You know, I was a little skeptical, mm-hmm. but, you know, it, it, it worked out. So there are other options, I think, oh, available. I, listen, my spiel to my patients, young or adult, is sun protection. Sunscreen is not the first thing I recommend. Sun protection is the umbrella, right? So what does that mean? Sun sun protection for me is first sun avoidance. Do you have to be out at 10 o'clock to two o'clock when the sun's at its, its highest intensity? If you don't have to be, then don't. Do you have to be out in a field by yourself taking the full brunt of the sun, you know, the hard sun? Uh, it's a great Eddie Vedder song. But uh, you know, do you have to have that beaten down on you all day no find some shade if you can or bring your own bring an umbrella right that's what you do so the sun avoidance first part secondly i absolutely agree with you that for me and 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 my kids and and my patients i recommend sun protective clothing first right it's a it's a no-brainer that when you're wearing that it's working yeah and it's funny that you said you had you had this cool thing i'm going to it, it used to not be so cool to wear this clothing. You were, you were kind of dorky looking. I'm right. I'm 40 now. I don't care. You don't care. You're, yeah. yeah. Our, our lives are over. But my kids still think I'm kind of cool, but that's slowly fading well, too. Try so convincing a 17 year old 
that you know they got to wear the long sleeve shirt at the beach or the pool party right it's like eh. they want to show off the muscles eh. and all that stuff yeah. i get it yeah and it's tough because right i mean that's what you do but it there is a company i well, coincidentally called Kula Bar. again no no conflict of interest here not yet but yeah not yet but they make a pretty decent non dorky looking line of products that are completely dedicated to exactly what you just said. You can get hats, you can get neck guards, you can get the rash guards, which our kids do at the beach. It's a, oh, it's a, it's a no brainer because it helps with not only the sun, but if you're boogie boarding, you're oh. not getting chewed up by the sand. Brutal. Yeah. So they have, uh, they've created slits in these things. So now the ventilation's better. It used to be like, oh, you start sweating oh, yeah. and uh, cooking rather than you're cooking from the inside rather than the out and it was like what's the point but now it's it's vented better the material's lighter sometimes it's even water water protective so you can get rained on and and uh you know sunscreen if it gets wet it's just coming off so i think this is to me the the, uh i would even put it in terms of front line over sunscreen and then where to use the sunscreen where where that clothing's not right you know so yeah it's all part of the same thing and i would also throw in eye protection that's part of sun protection so you need sunglasses absolutely one of the one of the first things i had a problem when i moved out to san diego was my eyes were it always felt like something was in them i don't like stuff on me i got my wedding ring of course but that's it i don't wear a watch i like my sleeves rolled up i don't like anything touching my hands or my face touch my nose we're gonna have problems well you're a skin doctor you don't want things touching your skin i I, I don't know i just i'm not a big fan of that and uh wearing Ray-Bans, you know, was a big thing for me, sitting on my no- the bridge of my nose, feeling it all day. I never got comfortable. So I didn't wear sunglasses while I was out in San Diego, driving around on the highways and stuff. And I it was a couple months where I felt like something was always in my eyes. And I went, and one of my buddies was an ophthalmologist out there, and he took a look, and he's like, you've got sun damage in your eyes. And you've only been here for about, you know, two years. Holy cow. You, yeah, you better pull it together. So just like we can get certain kind of skin lesions on our on our skin called actinic actinic keratosis which are what we consider pre-skin cancers you can get these growths in your eyes and and get these sort of um it, it literally makes it feel like something's in there like a grid of sand uh moisturizers lubricant for your eyes and sunglasses is a way to prevent that so you got to get the kind that are that literally say uv protective on them they're dipped in this special stuff that protects protects the uh, makes the glass not just transmit the radiation through it but uh, it's a no-brainer to have those on wearing them and protect your eyes so now sunglasses are a part of my life and I've still not gotten completely used to wearing them but when I'm outside when I'm driving around I'm, I'm, I'm using them more than not so you're then, lucky though you said you have good eyesight mm-hmm. for those of us who wear glasses you mm-hmm. for sunglasses you either have to get prescription lenses yep. or wear contacts mm-hmm. which I Absolutely hate yeah, to wear I, contacts, but you know there comes a again. It's risk versus reward. Sometimes you got to put them in, like if I'm playing a sport or yep. something like that. But then you want to put those sunglasses on. Yep. The the I mean I've I bought my first pair of glasses, my reading glasses. I, I now I'm, I'm finding myself going out to m- restaurants holding the menu out farther and farther. I can't. I need like <laughs> someone across the room to hold it for me. <laughs> so I got my first pair of reading glasses, and um, they were nice enough. Slash. Uh, I could afford it, I guess, to buy the kind that are polarized and also darken in the sun. Oh, the transitions. The transitions. Nice. And it, it's been very helpful. Yeah. So if you can do that, great. I mean, I, I understand that's that's a, there's extra, extra cost. Not everybody can do that. But I'm buying one pair, so I invested in them. And, and That's I exactly what I did. I was yeah. like, I'm not going to buy prescription sunglasses where mm. I'm only wearing them half the time. So I have, I call them my running glasses. They're, <laughs> whoop, they're tighter. They fit on the head a little bit yeah. better, and then they transition in the sun. So nice. those are my sunglasses. Well, and then the last part is the hat, right? So you know, you got you said the hood was sun protective, but a good oh, I wore hat. a hat too. Yeah, like a wide brim. There you go. Yeah. So that's the dorky hat, right? Everybody likes a good baseball hat. It looks mine was looked, actually looked, pretty cool. It was pretty just, cool. Yeah, just throwing that out there. I like the Australian kind of like you know oh, yeah. crocodile Dundee Darn style. Right. Yeah. If you're gonna go big, go big. Yeah. Yeah. It. You can sell yourself as as an expert just walking in, you know, to a situation. If you're wearing that hat, they're like, this guy knows what he's doing. Hundred percent. Like, yeah. for example, I'm going on Friday to the uh, U.S. Senior Open, mm-hmm. and I am hoping that they have like the U.S. Senior Open, like wide brimmed, mm-hmm. like straw hats. I'm going to get one of those. People think I'm a professional golfer yeah. for yeah. crying out loud. Who else would wear one of those? Things? That's right. <laughs> 
But do remember that the back of your neck takes a beating. You, you, I don't know what you call them, but the, the little, a lot of these hats have these little sort of drapes, curtains that flip down on the back of your neck to protect them. And that's a, that's a, a pretty important area. We see a lot of skin cancers up there on people, the back, top of the, the bottom of the neck or the top of the back, however you want to look at it. But that's an area where if you're not really careful applying your sunscreen, you can miss it. Also behind the ears, not a, not a common spot that people think about as having skin cancers, but unfortunately we see it, see it all the time. Interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about evaluations. Mm-hmm. When and how often should a person see a dermatologist? I mean, I remember seeing a dermatologist as a kid. I had real bad acne. Actually, it was like later on, it was like kind of awkward, like mm-hmm. 18 to like 20 something, like way past the point when you <laughs> probably should. When your peers have it. Yeah. So you don't look now, like, yeah. now, like I'm like the older guy who's like in yeah. college and has like a acne. Pr- it was awful. Mm-hmm. But anyway, when should a person and how often should yeah. a person see a dermatologist? So it's a great question because, and I'm not throwing the dentists under the bus, but somehow they were able to convince us to go to see them to get their teeth cleaned every six months. Okay. Right? That's what most people do. Yep. I won't, I won't put anyone on the spot here in the studio. but um, I, you know. no, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the toothless guy in the corner. <laughs> you should probably see it. Uh, no, every six months. Great. You know, that's wonderful. I don't know what, what's, what science supports that as the right amount, but it seems pretty reasonable. You got one set of adult teeth. You want to take care of them. No cavities, no fillings, blah, blah, blah. Good. How often, and I ask my patients this, well, how often do you see your dentist? They say most of the time, twice a year. How many times have you come to see a dermatologist for an annual skin exam? I guess I kind of blew that by saying annual. At least once a year is the expectation that I have for most people. And I can't tell you how many times they've never come to see a dermatologist. They've never had a skin a skin screening. And when I mean skin screening, I mean a head to toe exam where you're looking in cracks and crevices, right? Through the hair, behind the ears, in the mouth, in the eyes even to look. You can have uveal melanoma, um, the groin, the buttocks, between the toes, the bottoms of the feet. Why, you know, why are you looking at my feet, doc? What should we get asked? Well. Uh, Bob Marley, you know, yep, of course, Bob Marley, a lot of people think he died either because he was shot on a golf course, I've heard, or from a drug overdose. Okay. Do you know what he died from? I have no idea. Let me guess. Skin cancer. Skin cancer. Boom. Sp- specifically a melanoma. Now, Bob Marley was a very good soccer player. I did not know that. Yeah, really good. And he played a lot. And he thought after a game, I guess, that he had bruised his toe. I believe it was his great toe on his right foot, if I'm not mistaken. But he had a bruise, quote unquote, that didn't heal. And eventually he got it looked at. It turned out it was a melanoma. And it was early enough that if he had allowed them to amputate the toe, he probably would have made it. But because of his religious beliefs, he chose not to have that toe amputated, as the story goes. And that melanoma spread, sort of metastasized, and he eventually died from melanoma. So this is a, a, a skin of color man dark skin with a melanoma on the bottom of his foot you know how much sun exposure had to do with that melanoma Hmm. maybe not at all right i mean there's there's probably something hereditary or something so part of part of my spiel to my patients and their families is you never know right even if you're even if you live a, a pretty sun protected life in the bottom of a the basement, you know, in a, in a cubicle that you never see the sunlight. God, get a different job. But you know, but if if you're if you're that person, you still have some factors at play that could be influencing you if if to get a skin cancer or something else, right? So you need that set of expert eyes doing a full skin exam. And and the expert eyes part is one of the things that I have found myself over the, over the years really coming out strongly in favor and being more vocal about who's expert at doing this. Because you can find a bunch of people that'll tell you that they're skin experts. They, there are even some people that say they're quote unquote board certified in skin health. Um, unless, unless you're seeing a dermatologist who's done formal training in a board certified program through the ACGME, which is the licensing organization for training programs. And then that person has board certification as given out by the American Board of Dermatology. I'm gonna suggest that you look elsewhere 
Right? You want that board certification. That's that's a that's a clear sign that th- those people have been trained through a standardized curriculum. They are up to date, hopefully, with everything they need to know, and they're giving you the best care possible. And uh, a lot of people don't seek out a board certified dermatologist for the skin care. Mm-hmm. So, two things you can do as as a, as a layperson: one get a board certified dermatologist go to see that person Uh, if you are nervous that you're going to have to get naked i can tell you just as a side note it's it's a pretty amazing thing that that people will come in to see us and and disrobe and trust us that much with sort of you know their nether regions letting us take a look but that level of trust is, is pretty amazing but i can assure you that first off while it's happening we're not thinking about what we're looking at. We're, we're looking for what we need to look for. Sure. And it's an amazing thing. I don't know how it happens, but uh, when I step out of that room, I my brain has erased that entire encounter. Uh, I could, and please don't take offense if I see you in the hallway or out at the grocery store and I don't recognize you because I'm not looking at you as a as a as an individual. I'm looking at your skin right. as as an organ that needs to be examined. So if that helps to maybe decrease the anxiety of having to come in to see a stranger and, and disrobe, hopefully that helps. But um, but you need a board certified dermatologist. You need to do it completely. You need to have everything looked at. And you can ask for a gender specific dermatologist if, if you're lucky enough to have m- multiple options in the place where you live. So if you're more comfortable with a female dermatologist, great, ask for one. If you're more comfortable for the male, ask for one. You are always also encouraged to ask for a chaperone, right? So if you are are anxious or or concerned that a stranger is going to be looking at your skin, ask for someone to come in, uh, either bring a friend or ask for a staff member to be present just so you have an extra set of eyes there. You you can, maybe that, maybe that makes you more anxious, but for some people they like to have another person in the room just to make sure that everything's being done properly. And, um, and I say that for most people over 30, 35 years of age, that should be done once a year. Oh, wow. All comers. Okay. I would like to see us doing that. Um, now, then you've got the special populations, right? You've got, if you've had skin cancer, specifically if you've had melanoma, we may ask you as, as board certified dermatologists to come, let's say we catch one melanoma on you. We get it taken off. It's it's off. You're good. You're going to live a healthy life. We might want to see you every three months for a couple of years. Sure. And then we spread that out to every six months for a couple of years. And then eventually you get to every year again. But why is that? We know if you've got one melanoma, you're more likely to have another melanoma. And there've been some studies that suggest you're more likely to have another melanoma closer to when the first one showed up. Interesting. So we wanna wanna capture that and make sure we get small problems before they become big ones. Um, Other things that, you know, what medications have you been on in your lifetime? If you've been on a medicine that's lowered your immune system, I'm talking like significantly lower your immune system. So you're an organ transplant patient, and now you're on immunosuppressives that are keeping your immune system from attacking the organs. Well, that same medicine is keeping your immune system from surveilling your skin and catching skin cancers as they pop up. Or any other medicine that you see on TV. I don't don't know if you've noticed that, Mm -hmm. but every time they like advertise a medicine on TV, like the side effects, like why would anybody ever take these medications? And they they always have it like with a person like (laughs) running with a dog and everything's fine and they're just like, this could lower your immune system. Oh, by the way, you'll have, I'm like, I'm not taking that medicine. Well, yeah, the hair regrowth medicine that causes uh, impotence. You know, it's like, what's the point, right? I don't get it. Clearly that didn't work. (laughs) So, anyway, yeah, sorry, I digress. Right. So go, no, continue. Uh, totally. It, you, look, it's you have to you got to pick your battles. I think it's been a theme of this this show and risk benefit. So if you need an organ transplant, you're going to be on immunosuppressive medicine, sure, sure, right? Sure. Um, steroids can lower your immune system. Um, there are other medicines that people take for medical conditions other than transplants that can lower your immune system. So. That is a special population of people. They're they're more vulnerable than the normal person off the street. So they will get some special, more frequent exams. Children, right, that's my population, if there is a strong family history of skin cancer, what do I mean by that? Mom, dad have had melanoma. A brother or sister have had melanoma. Sometimes even far as far back as a grandparent having melanoma. I'd like to see that child 
at least as a baseline exam. And many times I'll say, I should see this person once a year because they got a bunch of moles or mm. I'm following one in particular. Sometimes I, I soften and say, every two to three years is fine. It looks great. Unless, okay, so unless applies for everybody, no matter what population you are. When do we want to see you, not a year from now when your annual exam is scheduled, but like this week? We want to see you if something, I think it comes down to probably the biggest, well, let me give you the historical part of this. You may have heard of the ABCDs of moles. Mm -hmm. Does that sound somewhat familiar? No. no. Asymmetry, border, color, diameter. And then they added an E called evolution. And that's the, that, keep that one in your mind. That's an important one. But, the, but we as a, as a group of specialists had to come up with a way to get the, the lay person to come in sooner when something was not right, right? So we said, if your mole is asymmetrical, what does that mean? If you cut it down the middle, one half looks like a different, the other half. Border, we like a nice crisp border. We don't like to see it sort of smudge into the skin and get lost. Color, nice one color throughout, and, it, and we don't like white, red, black. You know, a nice single color brown is, is usually okay. Diameter, less, they say less than a, a pencil eraser width, you know, 0 0.6 centimeters. And then E, evolution, a mole that's not changing. Great. A mole that's going from flat to raised or raised to flat, or it's developing a bump within it that wasn't there before, that's concerning. But those A, B, C, D, E's of, of moles, A, only apply to moles. There's other things that can change on your body. B, it's not a hard and fast rule. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that if all of those things were normal, then you are guaranteed that you don't have something bad growing on you. And or the flip side of that is just because one of those things or even a couple of those things are off doesn't mean you've got melanoma. Right. So, But it was the best way that we can make a public message to the layperson. I would say most dermatologists probably subscribe more to a paradigm that, um, for lack of a better word, pits what's called signature moles versus the ugly duckling mole. Okay, and, and the signature moles, I think, a pretty easy concept to understand. When you sign your name, writing checks constantly, <laughs> right? Amen to that. Yep. Uh, your signature kind of looks like it always looks, right? You, you, you can, there's a stereotypical look about your signature. Well, most people, when they make moles, if they've got a lot of them, you'll start to see, like, oh, they kind of all, like, there's the same color. They got blah, blah, blah. the ugly duckling mole is the one that stands out from the signature moles, right? There's, what is, this is a wonky looking thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's darker than the other ones. Maybe it's less discreet on the skin. Maybe it's the one that's itching and or, or bleeding, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that one's coming off from the dermatologist's perspective. Because what you don't want is, especially in a pediatric population, I see kids all the time with 20 or 30 moles. I just saw a kid the other day. I, I jokingly said to the family, like, I could put my kids through college whacking these moles off of you. We can play whack-a-mole, like at the carnival, you know? Right. And that's not fair to that kid. It's not fair to the profession. <laughs> and it's not fair to me, uh, you know, to, to do that to somebody. So you got to pick your battles. Um, we actually, we said, like, they all kind of look the same. Let's see you in a year. It's not a kid that I was going to give a pass to. I'm going to see that child in a year again. But um, it's that, that paradigm of ugly duckling versus signature can be helpful for the, the dermatologist to... Uh, isolate from the larger background and, and the, the clutter of all the moles that people have and go, like, this is the one we need to focus focus on today. And maybe it comes off. Maybe it looks better in a bottle as a biopsy specimen than it does staying on you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're wrong. Like I told you, um, we don't always, thankfully, we don't always biopsy cancers. You got to get a couple wrong to get the ones that you get right sure you know so you don't want to go to someone who's just biopsying cancers that means they're missing earlier cancers that they aren't slam dunks right yeah. and that's the goal we want to get these things off of you sooner than later so that they don't become big problems so my my recommendation is for certain vulnerable populations to see it to see your dermatologist as frequently as your dermatologist says you should right if they say every six months take it seriously come in there's a reason that we're telling you to do that it's not because we don't have uh, it's it's not because we're not full <laughs> right it's really hard to get into a dermatologist's office yeah. now one thing that St Luke's has done very uniquely in the area here is to say 
okay, how are we going to accommodate this? We, we just came off of doing a skin cancer screening at the Senior Open at Sock and Country Club. We do skin cancer screenings, our employees. We, we do a lot of things in the community around this. What do you do if you tell someone, hey, you got something on your arm that, need, that may need to be biopsied? The worst thing you can do is, is tell them they might have a skin cancer and then never see them back, right? right. That's medical and a legal disaster. I would say very close to that in terms of not a great patient experience is telling someone they've got something concerning and then making them wait six months. Right. And they're and they're interested to come in. They want to come in, but now they're losing sleep because, hey, a professional told me I need to be concerned about this. So we've created urgent dermatology clinics. Oh. And uh, it's, it's a model we went to about two months ago where the person – we don't have an, what's called an inpatient team. We don't have any dermatologists that just work at the hospitals. We have our clinics, and after hours, we share responsibility for going into the different hospitals. The, I think we're up to 13 or 14 now at St. Luke's where we would actually uh, be called in for, for skin care. And we share that responsibility, but it's an after-hours thing. So what we've done is we've sort of picked and gone on a week-to-week basis where our dermatologists share that responsibility, but the person who's on call for the week, instead of having their normal clinic, will have an urgent dermatology clinic at our St. Luke's Anderson campus. So Tuesdays, Thursdays, all day, and Friday afternoons, we have set up these clinics where on a seven-day notice, we can get people in for biopsies. That's great. Yeah, it's a, it's a spot of concern clinic in the afternoons, and in the mornings, it's a rash of concern. So something is blown up on you, maybe it's poison ivy, maybe it's a lupus flare, who knows? It's it's all comers, and then the spot of concern clinics in the afternoon is, hey, either my uh, family medicine physician, my internal medicine physician, my podiatrist, my orthopedic surgeon, my hairdresser said, I got something on me that you need to look at and potentially biopsy. We're going to get you in as soon as we can. And is it a, is it a hundred percent? No, it, it's not. I'm sure we'll get some phone calls saying, "I, I listened to that guy." And he, my own mother called last week to make an appointment and and um, and didn't get in. Right. So it was it was it's hard. We were we're very much booked out. But for the urgent clinics, we I can I can tell you if you need to be seen, we will get you into those urgent clinics. But for mom, can't you just go over to her house? You know, uh, strangely enough, my mom actually was on one of your shows for St. Luke's, The Peak. So she's oh. the she is the beautiful woman who was undergoing some skin cancer surgery on her chest from our one of our wonderful Mohs, micrographic Mohs surgeons, Nadia Abidi. And that skin cancer was something she showed me across from the dinner table. She said, I, what is this thing? And I said, Mom, that's a nodular basal cell. I'm almost positive. And oh, in fact, wow. it was. And but uh, she became then the spokesperson for our, our Mohs surgeon, which I don't, do you know what Mohs is? Have Mm-mm. you ever heard of that? Mm-mm. So Mohs is kind of an interesting thing. And we're fortunate enough to have um, two full-time Mohs surgeons and, and one part, part-time Mohs surgeon here at St. Luke's, uh, maybe adding more down the line. But Mohs surgery is the idea, first off, it's named after Dr. Frederick Mohs, a general surgeon, not a dermatologist, but as a medical student, Lore has it, he invented this technique of taking skin cancers off using a very special way that you lay out the skin. First, it starts with how you cut the skin cancer out and then lay it out eventually on the on the glass slide to be examined under the microscope. And if, if you think about it from like a clock perspective, I think that's probably the best way to describe this visually, a clock perspective where you've got, you know, the 12 o'clock, one, two, three, four, all the way around back to 12. The surgeon looks at the skin in sort of two dimensions, but cuts out the skin cancer in three. There's a deep portion of that. And they purposely angle the blade of their scalpel, which you wouldn't normally do for an excision, such that you could kind of cut this out almost like a a, a diamond shape thing. And that allows the processor to unravel the skin and lay it flat out so that the surgeon and this is unique to Mohs surgery, the surgeon actually becomes the microscope expert right there. Hmm. Sits down at a table with the microscope, examines the glass slide, and says, okay, going back to the clock, there's no cancer at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Oh, there's cancer still at 4 o'clock. So I've cut out the smallest thing. You come in after being biopsied, I should say. And so now the, the surgeon goes back to that area and cuts out the biopsy, hugging the corners. Says, oh, look, most of it's gone from the biopsy. Great. But there's still some cancer at 4 o'clock, and maybe there's some at 10 o'clock. So what does the surgeon do? He or she goes back just to those spots only, the 4 o'clock and the 10 o'clock, and cuts out another clock, another round clock, 
hugging the margins, taking as little tissue as possible, gets a new clock, a new unrolled piece of skin, says, oh, that four o'clock is now completely clear. There is no more cancer. We got it all. So trying to be less invasive. Less invasive. It's le- it's expensive real estate. Where do you use most surgery? Not everywhere. It's the, it's the head, the neck, the hands, and the front of your shins, actually. It's a tight area to, to close surgically. So you want to take as little normal skin as possible. So the surgeons also, the, the most surgeons are also trained in, in flaps, grafts, the techniques that plastic surgeons use, and, and they're expert at it. So cosmetically, you walk out, it's the only skin cancer where you can walk out assured that you no longer have skin cancer. Interesting. Yeah, because the because the microscope work was done right then and there. While you wait, that's the downside. It takes a little longer. Yeah, whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's- and To it, know that you're cancer-free, I'll it, take that. It makes for a good weekend, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So we're blessed to have what I would consider the single greatest Mohs facility I've ever seen at the Anderson Campus Center. Uh, it's five rooms, 225 square feet. It's They're outfitted with exactly what our surgeons need to do their job. My own mother was taken care of there. It's, it's just a wonderful thing. And we're, we're planning on doing something similar in the Allentown area as well. So uh, our patients on the West End are, are better taken care of as well. Don't have to travel as much. Fascinating. Yeah. All right, so three questions for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, number one, how do we get the word out that folks need to be screened better? Because I feel like you hit the nail on the head. Dennis somehow figured it out a long time mm-hmm. ago. So how do we get that same popularity to the to the public? Well, I like to have a little bit of fun with it. So it starts at home with you. You know, if 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 you're listening, you can get a mirror, you can get a partner, and have some fun with it. But start by looking at your own skin. Right. Okay. I mean, take a, take stock, take inventory of what you look like now, and a snapshot, literally or figuratively. Right. If you got a great memory, and, and you're watching, it's recommended once a month to do a self skin exam where you're just kind of looking at the mirror and looking and doing stuff. And but um, I've had patients who use their smartphones quite intelligently, pun intended, to take photos of moles that they're concerned about. They can do one of many things with them. They can use that picture to gauge month to month if there's any change. And some of them choose to send messages to us through our electronic medical worker and say, hey, am I supposed to be worried about this? And sometimes, yeah, yeah, you are supposed to be worried about that. Um, we also have virtual clinics that we offer through St. Luke's where we can we can actually, you don't have to physically come in, but you could, you could sit remotely. And, you know, COVID, if there's anything good that's come of COVID, we know that technology now has allowed us to have meetings and it could be a clinical meeting or a, a board meeting using technology so we can get people in who are even remotely located, you know, hour, two hours away. We've had patients from Cape May, New Jersey, see us in our Anderson clinic. That's like a three and a half hour drive, but we've made some crazy diagnosis, scurvy actually, um, and, and, um, and zinc deficiency, both from remote diagnoses that wow. we, we've been able to make without actually seeing the patient in, in real life. So the technology is there and you just have to be able to reach out to it. We have a dedicated phone line it's uh, 484-503-SKIN, uh, 7546, I believe that is, right? 7546, tell me. It's uh, 484-503-SKIN, and you call that number. Be patient. We do get, not a joke, over 400 calls a day. Good Lord. It's, it, it's But we, we will get to them, and we will get you in if you need to be seen urgently. If it's not a truly urgent thing, then we will have you pick a dermatologist based on your geographical preference and your dermatology preference. If it's urgent, is there a faster way to do it? Let's say something pops up and you're like, I got to take a picture of this and send yep. it digitally. How do I, how do, how do they do that? You can, you can, a, you can use that same phone line and, and navigate the tree and make sure that you get to a human being okay. uh, that that's listening. And they've all been, all of our derm concierges have been trained to understand that there is a, a level of urgency that we need to be able to address. I would tell you another wonderful resource is your other clinicians, right? So if you see a primary care physician, if you see a physician assistant or nurse practitioner, not even just in the St. Luke's network, you have them call on your behalf or send us a message. We use uh, any number of ways, email, Tiger Connect. This is like an online, like a, a private email, HIPAA compliant email thing. 
that you can text me from or my phone number. Yeah, you know, I give out my phone number to all my patients. I give out my phone number to all of my docs that I work with, and I get messages pretty much daily saying this is this is important or not, doc. And I I do triage them. Sometimes I say that's something we can see in three or four months when we have the opening. But uh, man, many times it's hey, we need to get that person in. So have your other clinicians, your primary care doctors, who are the quarterbacks for your care, make that phone call, make that communication to us, and and we'll make sure that we take it even more seriously. Excellent, excellent. Last question. So we're talking about possibly getting screened annually Mm -hmm. at this point. Um, Times are tough. Money is a concern. Is this considered a specialty thing? Like, is there going to be a problem with insurance if you want to go get diagnosed? Mm. You know, that kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Do you do you know if that's an issue? Well, it's funny at at the U.S. Open, U.S. Senior Open, we just came back from doing a skin cancer screening at one of the one of the patients or one of the. I shouldn't say patient. It wasn't a patient per se. One of the participants in this in the screen was a young guy and was working out as a caddy on the field. And he came for the screen, but then he said, you know, I've actually had a real hard time getting my primary care doctor to refer me to a dermatologist. For whatever reason, they wanted to sort of do it, handle the skin stuff themselves. And he was asking me that very question. I've never heard of a time where if, if sp- exactly for a specific thing or not, that uh, one of our primary care doctors would refuse a patient to be able to see a dermatologist and have only been partners with us in terms of making sure that we're not missing anything. So I, w- I think that that gentleman's experience was probably not universal, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, if, it, if it is a concern, what I have my patients sometimes do, especially if they have to have like a procedure done or we're trying to get a, a what, what could be an expensive medicine, many times behind the scenes, we have to ask permission from the insurance companies, which is a whole different topic and a good reason to work on the first floor so you don't jump out of a window and hurt yourself. <laughs> but but uh, the patients can call as, an, as their own advocate to their insurance company and ask, do I need a referral for X, Y, or Z? It might not even be for a dermatologist. It could be for some other service. Do I need a referral and and what would the copay for that service be, right? For our patients who are self-pay, meaning they don't have insurance or have in, or don't have um, insurance that other dermatologists in the area will accept because it's presumably a, a lower paying service. St. Luke's, one of, the, one of the things that attracted me to this network and one of the reasons I'm never leaving, uh, unless they you know, pull me away, is it's a nonprofit hospital with a true mission to take care of the community. So we have this wonderful resource in star community clinics where patients who are uninsured or, or don't have insurance that other doctors take can come through these clinics and we and you're seeing me. Hmm. You know, as a kid, you're seeing me. You're seeing any of my colleagues who see adult dermatology exactly as we would in any of our other clinics. The services are the same. In fact, the electronic medical record is the same. So you get you get nothing less. And there's really should be no excuse why someone can't see any specialist out there, let alone specifically a dermatologist, at least at St. Luke's, because we, we really do make an effort to see everybody. I love it. Yeah. Well, Dr. Andrew Grakowski, Chair of Dermatology at St. Luke's University Health Network, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's a wonderful time. And I am literally going to go home and call your <laughs> office right now. Okay. All right. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you.